Hi everybody, welcome to the show. I'm Marijuana Man, glad to have you back. Beautiful day here in sunny Vancouver, March 31st, it's like summer out there right now. And today what I'd like to talk about is, uh, well, the propensity over the years for slagging Mark Emery. Now, I don't know what it is, but uh, what I'm gonna refer to today is an article that appeared in Treating Yourself magazine, um, uh, some medicinal marijuana magazine uh, edited by a guy named Marco Renda. And uh, this article appeared, uh, it's called Counterfeit Seeds, They're Here. Now this is written by somebody named Otto Williams. Now I've never heard of this person in uh, the cannabis circles before, so I've got to assume it's a pseudonym, but I assure you, he's not related to me. But anyway, they start off by um, talking about uh, the seed industry in general, and then they get down to what um, they called the Emory years. And this is what I'd like to speak about because I was there, um, and a lot of the things that they've said are quite uh, not true. <laughs> Simply like that, uh, just crazy stuff. But uh, let's get to it. I'm going to see what's written in the article, and we'll talk about uh, each part. Now it starts off like this. About 15 years ago, Mark Emery kicked the doors open in British Columbia and made the world aware of what was happening here. In the early days, uh, Mark went to Amsterdam, uh, met up with uh, people like Ben Dronkers, for, who owned Sensi Seeds, and uh, the other big time seed breeders of Holland at the time, and it occurred to him that it would be a good idea to sell those seeds make money so that we could fight for legalization. So he came home and did just that. Um, got the seeds from Amsterdam and sold them to people all over the world. Now we sold seeds from every corner of this planet. Hundreds of thousands of orders were handled by just him and I and I'll tell you in those days we were really excited to do it. Um, to be able to send Northern Lights or Skunk Number no. One or Haze to somebody uh, in Akron, Ohio or anywhere, they'd never seen it, never been able to grow it. You could only get it in Holland. So it was very exciting times and uh, we were really happy to do it. Now, because of that uh, ballsiness that Mark had to do that and he advertised it, started putting it in magazines, uh, people started hearing about it, other breeders would come to us, local breeders, wanting to sell their seeds in our catalog. Now. These were companies like the Spice of Life, uh, Vancouver Island Seed Companies, Next Generation, Mighty Might Seed Company. They all got their start right in front of me, most of them, with the exception of Spice of Life a couple of years before that. But that's where this, uh, these local Canadian breeders have come from, was uh, from Mark Emery's desk. As the Emery ego machine grew, his need for cash grew. The seed breeders became the source for cash at any cost. I don't even know what that means as the Emory Ego machine grew, the need for cash grew. Well, that's insane. Uh, actually, having a large ego is free. Helping people all over the planet with uh, marches and demonstrations and court battles and buses to get to the court, hotels to stay in the city to go to the court, um, this actually costs real money, um, about four million dollars as it turns out. Now, you allude that uh, <laughs> these local seed breeders became the source for cash at any cost. Well, the customer was actually the source for cash. The seed breeders, uh, that was a different story altogether. Now, the ar article goes on. In the busts at the Emory Seed Shop during the mid-90s, the police seized much of the seed stock. In a bid to help with the cause, most seed breeders wiped the bill clean and restocked Mark with seeds to keep the fight going. Some forgave bills as large as $40,000 without even a thank you from Emory. Now yes, the police did raid us and bust us a number of times and uh, each time they did in those days they would take all the stock, you know, any of the seeds that were in-house and all of the stock in the store. But most seed breeders did not wipe the bill clean. We operated with them on a chit system. 
Uh, they would bring us the seeds. If we had money to pay for them at that time, we did. If we did not, we'd give them a portion of that money and a chip for the remainder that they would bring in at any time, and we would pay on that chit. Now, when we got busted, these people disappeared. They all ran away. They did not come and say, well, here's seeds to keep the fight going, and uh, they came with their chit. When it was evident that we had the balls to come back, or in the beginning Mark had the balls to come back and do this again, that's when they came back out of the woodwork with their chit. And we would continue to pay on the money that we owed them from before, plus the new stock that we would get to continue. Now, it also said that they gave, forgave bills as large as $40,000. Now, there was only one incident that there was a large number of local breeder seeds that were seized. Now, this was a, a breeder who desperately needed cash, had all these seeds, wanted us to buy it. Mark said, no, it's too many seeds. We don't want to have that around in case we get raided. This person begged and begged and begged until Mark relented. Sure enough, we got raided and those seeds got taken. Now, the bill that was owed for that, they, they had a falling out, and this person went uh, off, they went and never came back. Now, Mark made every attempt to pay this over the years, and this person would not communicate or accept that anymore. Now, the article goes on. They were usually okay with writing off these debts. It was going to fight for legalization and the legitimizing of the business. They considered it an honor to help out, an industry tax, if you will. Okay, well, I just, like I just said, that this is not the case at all. Seed breeders did not, were not honored to help out. They were there for money, every single one of them. They have never been involved in any of our marches or demonstrations. They've never kicked down any weed or any money or any sponsorship. They've not represented the cannabis culture anywhere, anytime. So to say that they were honored, an industry tax, if you will, not a chance. The people that we owed the most money to, local breeders, sat right beside the desk, waiting for the money to come in. And as soon as it came in across that desk into that till it went into their hands. That's how honored they were. Now, come on, these people, it's not true at all. But Emery was more interested in the political, and he often sacrificed the integrity of the seed business for cash. When this happens, many of the BC breeders stop supplying Emery and look for other avenues to sell their seeds. Mark wasn't more interested in his political fight. The fight was all, it was all encompassed. The seeds were no different than the store. The seeds were no different than anything else in terms of our fight for legalization. It was a way to make money. And we had no problem selling them whatsoever. Now, these are broad statements that says he often sacrificed the integrity of the seed business for cash. That's not true at all. We had no problem getting the cash. People were lined up. We were the only people on the planet selling seeds outside of Amsterdam. So we had no trouble. It was pouring in. Orders were pouring in the mail, and people were lined up at my desk to buy them over the counter. Now, there was no seed breeders. You look through, you can look through all the old catalogs of ours, and you'll say, see that the same seed breeders have been there from the beginning till we got busted in 2005, with the exception of one, and that was the guy who had all the seeds that we got raided, and we owed him that money. Off they went. That was only one person in all those years that ever left our fold because we were all they had. We were their bread and butter as well. It's not like it was just us making money off them. That's all they did was come and get money from us and we gave them millions of dollars over the years. So I don't think that they ever lost a dime really in retrospect even if uh, a chit didn't get paid but I'm not aware Mark was a very fastidious man when it came to paying his bills he pays everybody he doesn't welch on anything so Emery's dishonesty in the seed business took on several different faces first it was the blatant swapping of seeds of more expensive varieties for local knockoffs Okay, now this is a very 
nasty little statement as far as I'm concerned. Emery's dishonesty took on several faces. Now, that isn't true at all. There was no dishonesty going. Now, it says first is the blatant swapping of seeds <laughs> of more expensive varieties for local ones. Not. Didn't happen. There was no reason for it to happen. We had the integrity of caring about what people got. There's no way that we substituted Jordan of the Islands for Dutch passion. My God. Who would do that? Why? There was no reason to do it. If you look at it from a monetary point of view, we already had the money from the customer. Now, there'll be many customers out there that would attest to the times that they had to wait an exorbitant amount of time. And I, I'll apologize to them if they're seeing this now. That, but I'll tell you, they waited until we got the seeds that they ordered. not. Why, why, why did they wait? Were we that maniacal that we were going to steal their money and swap their seeds and make them wait? Not a chance. And here's what would happen when they did wait and we would get the seeds and we'd put them in there and we'd give them bonus seeds from our local breeders, which promoted them even further. There was no seed swapping going on, not by me, not by Mark, that's for sure and not by any of the people that were hired to do it because they, they didn't care enough to, why would they care? So that didn't happen at all and that's a nasty statement that has been dogging me since I read it and these people you need to snap up here and not be spreading stuff around that, that you, you're just making up and is hearsay. Uh, writing under a pseudonym does not disqualify you from telling the truth. Now, come on. And it goes on.